everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, I am Nicola Izzo. I'm a PhD student from Politecnico di Milano, Italy. And uh, I did this project with uh, a company which is called Revenge. And uh, it's uh, an it's a small Italian startup uh, whose core product is uh, uh, the compiler tool, uh, but also they do uh, consultants on uh, static and dynamic uh, binary translation and other program analysis techniques. Good morning. I'm Taylor Simpson. I run the LLVM compiler and tools team at Qualcomm. Uh, I live in Austin, Texas. Um, Nicolo and I found out about each other doing the same project independently and then decided to, to come together and do this talk and ultimately we want to merge our code together and contribute it into, and get it merged into QEMU. Okay, so what are we going to talk about today? First we'll tell you what Hexagon is and we'll give you enough of an introduction to QEMU so the rest of the talk makes sense and then we'll talk about the challenges and what we did and then wrap things up with uh, some status and next steps, and actually there'll be a demo. Okay, so what is hexagon? Here, this is a mouthful. It's a very long instruction word, digital signal processor. It's a, a processor that's designed by Qualcomm and used inside Qualcomm's SOCs. The VLIW part means that the instructions that execute in parallel are actually encoded into the binary. This is different from a superscalar, which analyzes the instruction stream and determines which instructions are independent and can be executed in parallel. On hexagon, it's actually encoded into the instruction stream. And so that reduces area and reduces the power consumption uh, processing. And we call it a digital signal processor because it processes lots and lots of digital signals within the SOC, starting with the digital signal that comes from the cell tower to your phone. Then there's also Wi-Fi. There's voice, there's digital signals from your camera and your sensors. So there's lots of these around. In my phone, I have four of them. The, my shirt was a commemoration of shipping 10 billion hexagons into the world over the course of about 14, 15 years. So we're pretty proud of it. So let's take a look at the, uh, what the assembly syntax looks like. Uh, if you don't look too closely, you might think it's C code. The instructions are algebraic, so on the left-hand side is a destination, and then there's an equal, and then there's something that looks kind of like a function call with the opcode and then in the operands in parentheses. So the curly braces indicate that all those instructions execute in parallel. Uh, and the semantics are they all start at the same time, so effectively in parallel they all do the reads of their operands, and then they do in parallel the operation, and then in parallel they write the results. That'll be important later. So this packet you see here has four instructions in it and then an end loop at the end, which manages the looping. This is actually one of the packets of the inner loop of FFT for hexagon. It's not the whole inner loop, but part of the inner loop. Yeah, so since you're here at the KVM forum, you probably know what QEMU is. However, um, among, among the three possible operating modes of QEMU, the user mode, the system mode, and the virtualization, we'll be just focusing on the user mode. And uh, despite, I mean, uh, we will be not be using the KVM features of QEMU since we are translating from uh, a different architecture, the hexagon architecture, to, I mean, the native architecture, and not many of you uh, run Linux on your hexagon laptops. So, because there aren't, there aren't any. So we are using the TCG translation feature of QEMU, which basically uh, has the granularity of a translation block. So uh, each translation block is taken, is decoded. I mean, the binary instructions are decoded to their actual representation, and they are translated to uh, some assembly-like instructions called TCG ops. Then the TCG ops are finally translated into the destination architecture of your, the machine you're running QEMO on. Um, it has to be said that the translation for each translation block is done only once, uh, except if the block changes. So the thing actually runs pretty fast. 
So to give you an example, I mean, the, the TCG ops are generated by some uh, C functions inside of QEMU. They look like the one you, you see in the top of the slide. So you have basically uh, the name of the operation, for example, TCG gen add. Okay, and then some suffix about the size of the operation. In this case, TL means target length, which is the side of the registers of the target machine. But uh, let me give you an example of a, uh, an example translation of x86 assembly to TCG opcodes. In this case, we have a, a, a single x86 uh, instruction, which is a call instruction and that gets translated into those four TCG ops. Uh, the first one is uh, a subtract operation, which basically um, decreases the stack. Then we use a store operation to save the return address into the stack. And then we update the stack pointer, and then we jump to the uh, target of the call, which is the address 0x2000. In uh, our goal uh, was to create the hexagon implementation for QEMU, so to feed QEMU with hexagon binaries, okay, which after the decoding will look like the bundle we see on the left of the slide, so these curly braces with uh, four, up to four uh, hexagon assembly instruction in it, and we had to take that and translate it into TCG ops. Okay, so, so why is this hard? The first, re first set of reasons come from the, the semantics of the packet or the very long instruction word. If you remember, the semantics is not the same as executing the instructions serially. At the beginning you do all the reads, then you do all the operations, and then you do all the writes. So this packet that you see here definitely does not produce the same result as if you had in in executed those instructions sequentially. It actually does a swap of register R1 and R2, or sorry, R0. Uh, you can have more than one jump in a packet. So uh, they don't always act like they execute in parallel. In fact, only one of those jumps will get executed when you execute that packet. You can have more than one store in a packet, and those have to be serialized because they can point to the same place. In this example, you see a store of a word at the same address as a store of a byte. So you have to do the word first, uh, and then the byte overwrites that one, the first byte of the word. Then we have something called dot new, which takes advantage of a forwarding path in the microarchitecture. So you, you know, you've done your reads, and then you start the operation, and then this operation has produced its result. It can forward it to another one that's executing in parallel. So we call that dot new. So you're using the value of one of the other produced by one of the other instructions in your packet. And the order that you see them in the uh, serial encoding of the packet doesn't have to be the order that they need to execute when you run TCG, so we might have to do some rearranging. In this case, the one on the right, you have to do first to get the value of P0 in order to feed that into the test there of the if. And you can have multiple predicate definitions in a packet. I'd actually forgotten about this. We were lamenting last night over dinner. So in this example, I have two writes to P0 in the same packet. And the semantics of that is they get anded together. Okay, so, and then it has precise interrupts and exceptions. So when you have a packet, either all of the instructions commit or none of them commit. And last but not least, there are over 2,000 user mode instructions. So that's a lot of instructions. OK, so how do we deal with this? Well, uh, for the packet semantics, sometimes we have to reorder the instructions. So there's some analysis you do when you've looked at the packet to figure out the order you want to generate the TCG code in. And then we use the temporary register set for all of the destinations. And then we process that after we've processed all the instructions of the packet, writing it back to the normal uh, state at the end. And then we commit only if there are no exceptions. Okay, so 
Now, how do we deal with the, the large number of instructions, 2,000 uh, instructions? So uh, I have the advantage, since I work at Qualcomm, I have access to uh, the code for the existing simulator for Hexagon. We call that Hexagon Sim. And it's an interpreting simulator. So unlike uh, QEMU, which generates code for all the instructions and then executes it, this, this simulator just interprets it. But we have the exact semantics uh, of all the instructions written in C. And that simulator is actually used to verify the RTL. So we know it's very accurate representation of what the processor is doing. So I wanted to leverage as much of that code uh, as possible when building QEMU for Hexagon. Okay, so QEMU has the concept of uh, a helper within TCG. So it gives you a way from within your TCG code to call out to a C function that you write. Usually this is used for very complex things that are difficult to represent in TCG, but as you'll see in a minute, we can use this very handily for Hexagon. So every helper has three parts, and I generate them from the architecture specification using a Python script. So the architecture library that is part of the simulator, for every instruction, there are effectively two things. There's a tag, which is a unique label for the instruction. I'm going to use that to name a lot of the things that we generate. And then there's a little snippet of C code that is the semantics. So in this case, it's just an add. And the operands are named in a very idiomatic way. So the D indicates that that's the destination, and then the S and the T indicate that they're sources. So that tells me what the signature of this helper function needs to be, right? two operands and one destination. So I can use Python and generate the three things I need for a QEMU helper. The first one is a prototype, and that def helper macro there gets expanded uh, twice, actually, once for uh, a function that let you call that function from GCC, uh, from TCG, excuse me, and then another one that gives you the header for the function itself. Okay, so then we can generate the call. So we start off with some code to pull the operands out of the registers that they're in. Then we generate the call to the helper, that's in the red box there, and then we generate code to write it back into the temporary that we talked about earlier, and then we free up the TCG variables, and off we go. And then finally, we generate the implementation, and you see there in the middle where we've just pasted the C code representation inside there, and the Python script is generating all the stuff around it. So this, this approach has some advantages and some disadvantages. One of the advantages is that I can very quickly get all the instructions implemented, all 2,000 of them were implemented very quickly. And I know that it has the very same semantics as what the simulator does, which as I said earlier, is gonna be verified against the hardware, so it's a very true representation of what the processor is actually doing. Now their disadvantage is that all those function calls have a lot of overhead. So that ad you just saw, that's a lot of work to set up the uh, call stack and the registers, make a function call, just do an add and then tear down the function on the return. It's also a barrier to optimizations that TCG can do. So TCG can do things like constant propagation, uh, copy folding, instruction combining, things like that. But if it's a bunch of function calls, there's not much it can do to optimize. So how do we fix that problem? So I kind of glossed over this before, but if you notice what I generate, there's this F wrap macro around the call to the gen helper. And I can override that with an actual implementation in TCG of the instruction. So if you're familiar with TCG, you'll know that an add is just TCG gen add TL, and then the destination and the two sources as the operands. So now I have, instead of making a call to a helper, I've actually generated the add in TCG that I need. So this is a good lead-in into the approach what the Revenge guys did. Yeah, so while Taylor was building his own implementation, I mean, having access to all the actual description uh, in C of the semantics, we, we didn't have any of those material. We just had the, basically the ISA manual. 
So the ISA manual contains for each assembly syntax of the architecture a pseudocode, okay, which uh, is meant to be read by programmers and describes the functionality of the instruction. Uh, for example, here we see the uh, uh, subtract instruction and the uh, corresponding pseudocode. So we asked ourselves, I mean, we, we don't want to implement by hand 2,000 instructions. Can we just use, can we translate these pseudocode snippets into actual TCG generation code? Yes, we, we exactly did that by using uh, the Flex and Bison tools. And uh, yeah, it, it works uh, basically like this. I mean, uh, we have at the top of the slides, we have the pseudocode. So we parse that using Flex and Bison. We generate the, the parsing tree you see on the left of the slides. And then using syntax directed translation of Bison, we are able to actually emit some QEMU code, which does uh, the ex preserve, has the exact semantics of the instruction. So that in the end, we'll generate some, uh, a group of TCG ops which will perform the operation of the semantic of this instruction. So, in, uh, I mean, the whole process looks a bit like this. We uh, have the ISA manual, the, the, the PDF you download from the Qualcomm SDK, and we painfully extracted all the information about the encoding of each instruction and about the, uh, the pseudocode of each instruction manually, <laughs> and um, all the resulting, the resulting two TCVs, I mean, the, the first one, the one containing the encoding, is actually fed into a script which uh, automatically generates a decoder tree for that, and we had to use that because the fixed bits inside the encoding of each instruction, the one which determines which kind of instruction is that, they are not just isolated in maybe in the first part, in the first byte. They are spread around the instruction. So we had to uh, figure it out automatically which, was, which were the best bits to disambiguate to build a, an efficient tree. Then after that, we we took the, the pseudocode of each instruction and fed, it, fed them into our uh, parser built with Flex and Bison. And a result, as a result, we had these two C files, uh, which were ready to be compiled in QEMU, and they provided the semantics for each of the, I mean, most of the uh, 2,000 instructions. So which is the current status and which are the limitations of our implementation? We were able to reach an astonishing speed at 28 times. We were 28 times faster than the existing simulator, Hexagon Sim. And we have a complete Linux user space support. But we, uh, so yeah, we also support the semi-hosting syscall system and we extensively tested our code. I mean, we have a 51 unit test built into QEMU to just verify that the semantics of each instruction, of main instruction is correct. But we also have some real program which can execute, and Taylor will show that in a few moments. Also, both our implementation are publicly available on GitHub, and we think that's a uh, nice good start to uh, the road to upstreaming. Okay, so the next steps are to merge the two implementations. Uh, we would like to get review from the community. Anybody's willing to help, please get in touch with us. Uh, and ultimately our goal is to get this merged upstream. Longer term, we'd like to see tighter integration with the LLVM for Hexagon. Uh, we need to do the system mode. And since our tool chain is based on LLVM, we have the LLVM debugger. So if anyone has experience getting LLVM to talk to the GDB stub and QEMU, I would love to buy you a beer. Okay, so let's do a demo. Okay, so here I have a little factorial program. It's a 
Qualcomm DSP binary. And it just computes a factorial. It can take an argument from the command line. Okay, over in this window, I'm gonna, we have a, a gzip program. So I'm gonna time hexagon simulator. Okay, so it's gonna print out the size of the file that it's reading and then it's gonna tell you as it reaches every 100,000 steps. There you go, QEMU's already finished. It, whoops, I forgot to time it. It takes about a second. <laughs> And the, the Hexagon Sim version takes about 30 seconds. So a lot faster. Um, the next thing I want to point out is that from the shell, if I say dot factorial, right now the Linux kernel on this machine doesn't know what factorial is. Oh, I typed it wrong. It doesn't know what that binary format is. But QEMU comes with a little helper script to set up the bin format misc translation for all the targets. And see the last line there says it set up QEMU hexagon as a bin format interpreter. So now I can say dot, dot factorial. So this is handy if you want to write testing scripts and so on. Now for the really fun part. Uh, I have a root file system that's a very basic Linux root file system for hexagon on this machine. So I can cheroot So if you know what cheroot does, it makes that directory the base of your file system now and then it executes slash bin slash bash from that directory. Which <coughs> bin slash bash is actually a hexagon version of bash. So all the utilities, ls, cat, file itself is actually a uh, hexagon version. All right, so th there's your description of what bash is. LS is another utility. It's compiled for hexagon and using QEMU hexagon to execute it. So pretty fun stuff. Okay. So let's wrap things up. What did we learn? We learned that the semantics of a VLIW processor make for some interesting challenges when you're trying to generate code. The large number of instructions of hexagon requires some automation in the generation of TCG. Uh, we do believe that this code generator approach can be useful for other new architectures that want to port themselves into QEMU. And finally, we're very, very, very happy about the performance as being 28 times faster with, than the current simulator. So, questions? Uh, two quick questions. So the, the first one, uh, the demo you were running, was that the pure TCG version, not the helper version? That was 28 times faster. It was the, the helper function, the helper version with a lot of functions manually, a lot of instructions manually overwritten. Uh, oh, so emerging with two, I get it. Uh, the second one, as you said, um, when you do your uh, final commits, everything has to commit or nothing commits if there's a fault. So if one of, one of your instructions faults, how do you unroll, say, say this? So the, the, the work of each instruction is done in a data structure on the side that if you don't commit, you just throw that away. And if you, if you decide at the end of the packet that you do want to commit that, then you, there's TCG code to copy the, the temporary state into the permanent state. Ah, so it's just for the registers, register file. So what, right. what about uh, stores to memory? Are they implicitly serial? Those are recorded in a, in a side data structure as well. You, you record the address of the store and the size and the value and then in a little data structure on the side, and then during the commit sequence, 
you look at that and actually perform the stores to memory. So if the third store fails, you roll back the previous stores that you've done. So you haven't actually stored anything except into a little temporary side data structure yeah, but you until don't, you commit. But you don't know whether or not it's going to fault and, until you actually try and do it, right? So no, you can check the address whether it's going to fault. Oh, so you're checking each ad address before, before you so. actually do the store. Right, okay. uh, sorry, I didn't understand your question. Okay, thanks. So this is pretty cool stuff, uh, but I was wondering how you were dealing with the predicates. You explained that the predicates are ended together, and so um, does your data structure basically set a one for all the predicates, and then you end there as you execute? How does that work? Right, so the, the side data structure sets all four predicates as not being assigned yet, and then on the first assignment, you copy that value in, and set the bit that it's assigned. And on a subsequent one, you and it in with the, the first value and leave the, leave the is it set alone. So between that and the commit logic, uh, what is the ratio, the performance ratio between the x86 version, uh, for instance, of the emulated code and the native uh, DSP in terms of instructions per cycle, these kind of things? Uh, so I haven't measured the measured it relative to the hardware. Um, that's an interesting question. There's a question in the back. Uh, so two uh, related questions. Uh, do you really have two thousand instructions, or do you have? a regular variation on a small set of instruction types. And the uh, second question is, um, have you compared your two implementations in any way to ensure that they actually generate the same result? Um, OK, so the first question was, are there really 2,000 instructions? Um, if you look at the, the architecture library that I started with, there are, yes, more than 2,000 uh, instructions. Um, but there are lots of patterns. You know, so there's lots of loads, and there's variations of you know, a load of a byte with different addressing modes and so forth. And those are all counted as unique instructions. Can I yeah, about that, I mean, in the instruction manual, they actually grouped up. Uh, typically, a couple, a pair of instructions, they are represented by a single meta instruction. For example, when two instructions, one have a not and the other haven't, or maybe one have, have an or and the other has an end. And basically, what we do is we translate the meta instruction, and then we do a pattern matching to actually map each instruction to the correct semantics. So, but they are still quite a lot, like more than 1,000. On the second question. And then, oh, the second question was how do we make sure the two implementations produce the same result? Uh, so that'll be some work that we have to do when we merge them. Um, the RevNG, Revenge implementation uses uh, the standalone runtime and the Angel semi-hosting calls, and, and the Qualcomm implementation uses Linux user space. So the quickest thing would be to have them pull the Linux user space into their implementation, and we can run a lot of programs on top of that and make sure they execute the same way. Uh, alternatively, we could uh, have them uh, generate from their Flex and Bison tree the FRAP macro definitions that you saw earlier in the presentation. Do you want to say anything else on that? No. So thank you.